All right, guys, welcome to the show. I hope you sat there, you know, either fucking scantily clad or dressed in your world around you branded clothing. If you're not, go to worldaroundyou.com, order yourself a T-shirt, listen to these shows, and then come back to these shows when you've got your T-shirt and listen to the show in your T-shirt. Anyway, I'll let you crack on with the show. All right, guys, I'm the world around you, and this... This is pause for thought and threshold FM. Now, I've been away for a few weeks trying to work on a book about torturing in sloths, but I thought I'd put a show together and I'm going to, you know, they'll be coming more regular than that again. Though if you're listening to these on demand, it's not really going to make a difference to you. They'll still be coming out pretty much every week. But I'm, I'm hoping this week we can we can pro- hopefully learn something a little bit different from the last episode, which I think were about Tracy Weaver, which, a um, little disclaimer, made it all up. It was my Christmas tale. That was the Christmas special that went out Christmas time on Threshold. But it doesn't really matter because it's not all that Christmassy anyway. Um, but this week, what are, what are we learning about? Well, they're easily the deadliest thing in the world. Responsible, right, for a lot of deaths and probably even more injuries than they are deaths. Often coming to our country from overseas on the back of boats by the thousands. They roam our streets day and night, right? But at night... They can be even more deadly, you know. Especially if they're black. The black ones are usually the most dangerous of them all, according to statistics. They're often accomplices in uh, uh, a big part of murders, uh, rapes as well, and and even very well-executed burglaries. Now, obviously we can't tarnish them all with the same brush. Uh, Some of them are very family-orientated, you know, but, but they are always prevalent in certain crimes, like you... These crimes only really happen with these, uh, let's call them things, you know. Now, and because and, without them, some of these crimes would, would be, you know, entirely impossible. But maybe, maybe they're the cause for other crimes throughout history. Maybe even responsible for causing neurological disorders in young people. But is this their first time here? Were horses their substitute for a while? Hopefully, we'll touch on at least some of these things, because this week, we're discussing the one enemy of cyclists the world over. The motorised vehicle, a.k.a. a car. But first, let's have a song. This is Nas, John Legend and Florian Picasso with Tomorrow. Cars, right, yeah? They've been around for ages, innit? Slowly improving... Whilst computer chips get better every two years, though, according to Moore's Law, so why are cars so stunted? They've been getting used for longer than computer chips, well longer. Now, where's the improvements for the user? They've been getting used for, you know, fucking long distances. Maybe they'll add in a cup holder or something like that, but that's not a real improvement, innit? They've just been few and far between. Even when we was on horseback, right, we'd be looking to breed the horses with better horses to genetically alter the horses long before the genetic splicing facility in the moon was even hinted at in the Disney movies. So why are cars all very similar? You know, sure, you know, there's there's front and and rear wheel drive, that's a difference. There's there's three wheelers, four wheelers, four door, three door, five door, uh, sliding doors, suicide doors, automatic and manual gear change. But where's the big improvements? Where's the descending wheels that drop from the middle of the chassis at a 90 degree angle to the regular wheels to aid in parallel parking so the car just slides sideways into its spot? Uh, You know, there's now more than... There's ever been of people knocking about, right? And more densely populated areas. So that seems like the next logical step for a car, at least like 10 years ago. And it's still not there, innit? Where are all the cars that can drive through these deep puddles from the floods we keep having? From the so-called manu- uh, man-made climate change, you know? You, it, that, you know, why can't they drive through these puddles without being fucking ruined? Where are the cars that have a built-in cooler box and a built-in oven so that when you go shopping after work because everyone's working longer and longer hours that they, they, they can't keep your beers cold and start cooking your pizza so that it's ready for when you get home? Or so when you get home, you've only got to put it in the oven for five minutes rather than 15. They, 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 just, they just don't exist. So what are they really for? But before we get into all that, how long have they been here? Now, the records of ancient people discussing the gods that visited from the skies, they all describe things like chariots uh, with um, lightning and thunder and fire. 
They detail excessive weapons that caused cancers and, and ruined crops wherever they went and wherever they landed, you know. Now, to me, that sounds a lot like some form of motorised vehicle, doesn't it? Maybe even a spaceship. But there's a good chance that what these were were actually some form of time traveller or alien in massive machines that were spewing out chemicals and smoke. And, I, and you know, I'm not the only person and the first person to claim that, and I'm not going to claim to be. But I do have a little thought about time travellers there. Now, if we can actually, we can, in essence, become a time traveller, we can, because you've got that thing where a watch will be a second behind if you spend a bit of time on the space station. But there's that idea if you travel for a, for 40 years, or 20 years in one direction out into space and 20 years back, the Earth will be 100 years in the future. But what if you was to go the other way? It's, surely there must be a different way to do that so you can go back in time. Maybe they did it accidentally at some point and then they were like, fuck, we've gone back thousands of years, but it's only been 30 years well, for us and they've got all this mad stuff because maybe they're from our future. Not like they've come back here from our future, but we've gone we're in the future and we've gone back to our past now in these better spaceships or whatever because we're taller and bigger because apparently we've been growing and growing and growing since we've been evolving because obviously we all used to be about three foot tall and now we're, we're not, we're a lot bigger. But that's just a thought anyway and it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit away from what we were going to discuss. It's a lot more reasonable in it to believe that um, time travellers were in spaceships and, and and these things in these chariots were actually machines and, and aliens if you like than than to believe that the, the African or, or the, the more specifically Nigerian god called Shango rode on a horse and he had the power of thunder, fire and lightning. Because if that was true, right, he'd be getting through fucking horses like the workshire getting through lateral flows, mate. It's much easier to believe that there was once a group of people who existed with access to technology. Technology that could be equal to our own, but back 3,000 years ago, it might have seemed advanced to the people that they were invading, because, you know, that's what you've got, you've got to see it, innit? You've got to see it as an invasion of sorts. You can't overlook that Shango could have been flying a spaceship and all, or maybe did actually own some form of magical horse, but... What if horse is just a word that we use in historical documents to make people believe that time is moving slower or to make us feel special? What if we've always had cars and vans and, and the paedophiles that drive vans, but somehow, right, someone came along and was like, I want to control these people and control what they think, and they're like, let's, let's swap out white van man for chariot racer and then back in roman times we think everyone in the roman times nowadays was like oh we highly regard the chariot races and that's why there was so much written about chariot races but think about all the newspapers and that from when you was a kid and all the stories you heard about white van men uh, white 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 ven men well, right white van man right white van mans like the, the fellas in white vans that would abduct, abduct kids and that you know and maybe all the odd old woman every now and then we had loads of stuff written about them because the fucking we needed to know about them. Maybe that's what chariot racers were back then, but they didn't call it the white van man. They called it the chariot racer. Because to be honest, realistically, how are we supposed to know any different? It becomes even more believable when you remember about Anatello Fomenko. We've spoke about him quite a few times now and his theory that who or whatever Jesus actually was was based on something that happened 800 years ago rather than 2,000 years ago. So if you look at history in that sense, this 3,000 years, well, 3,000 BC or whatever, these gods were realistically could have been what like two and a half thousand years ago so 500 bc but the nigerians aren't the only people to go on about so-called horses throughout history i've collated a few examples here in my notes of where scholars may have retconned our history to ignore the machines right there was a belief that horses would carry you to valhalla which we can see isn't true and it ties in with the idea of horses replacing machines because if you remember if you've ever been to Blackpool Pleasure Beach um, on the way to Valhalla there is machines in the queue rather than you know there's no depiction of horses from memory there's vending machines I think that give out thin plastic ponchos which in in this iteration of the mythical realm and the horses are actually reserved for the steeplechase possibly a way to try and affect children's minds to seeing horses and other equestrian species as relegated to a position of servitude uh, and especially when you consider you know like the donkey rides in uh, Blackpool Beach and the horse-drawn carriages down the seafront now right consider what I think of I think the Brazilian traditions maybe traditions is the wrong word but uh, I think it's a Brazilian hobby habit 
I don't know what the word is, but think about what they do with with donkeys and that. Uh, it's definitely South America, at least. But they view, you know, the, they view the donkey as more of an equal in in some of their entertainment, at least. You know, sometimes uh, in certain um, shows, maybe it's even the donkey's more important than the human counterpart. But modern donkey shows aren't the only time a horse has been equal to a person. There are some Buddhist stories and one of them's about this prince who he decided to forego his life of riches to explore the world around him. And when his journey came to an end and it was, uh, I imagine, time to shoot his horse in the back of the head uh, like, a, like a CIA whistleblower, his horse got granted reincarnation into an enlightened human being, which I guess if you remember the, the Life Actor episode, maybe that's what happens nowadays. It's what we replace horse with possibly a robot clone or a clone of a person or just a person wearing a mask on the face of some sort or holographic projection on them. And then when when they do their task, they become a different being of a higher stature kind of thing. But that's that's grasping at straws. Now, it, it, it seemed to be a, lo- a bit of a low blow, though, to this prince because the whole intention of his journey was to become enlightened. So it seems a bit cruel that his horse would become an enlightened human being, but I, I've got no idea if he managed it. So it's got to have been a bit bittersweet for the guy, but maybe that's all part of his, of his journey, you know, of his learning. Now, the earliest record I could find of horses being domesticated comes from about 3500 BC in Kazakhstan. Now, we mainly know this because there was this pair of competing neighbours one of them got a mule, and then the other one is next door got a mule, uh, so it's written. And then the the first guy got a donkey, and the neighbour next door got a donkey and all. And then the the first guy uh, got a horse, and this was considered to be supposedly the greatest success of the country, as for quite a while it's believed to have been the first and only horse domesticated in the world, because the other guy um, couldn't get one, couldn't get his hands on one. Now what I think is mental there is. Where do you get that horse from? Right, so I know you get that cliche of oh, it was the guy who first, you know, played with a cow's teat. But you can imagine you can see an animal suckling on the teat of a of a if its mother, and you think, well, it's you know, it's good enough. It's good enough for the goose. So it must be good enough for the gander, kind of thing. Um, probably a terrible animal in example because they come from eggs. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know the. It's good for the calf. It's good for the heifer. You know, it doesn't really work. But um, to, for the horse, like what what had he seen riding a horse and going, we should do that and all? Because maybe that's where the uncanny valley um, thing comes from. Maybe there was this other species of creature on the earth and they would ride horses around and we were like, you know what? It's a fucking belting idea, that. Let's, uh, let's nick some of their horses and breed them and sell them and eat them. Fucking horse meat's one of the best meats I've ever eaten, mate, in Italy. They give you, like, horse fillet, and it's fucking, like, hair. It's just shredded fine, like hair. Bit of Parmesan cheese, bit of salt, squeeze a lemon, mix it all together in a bowl and just eat it like crisps, mate. It's fucking well nice. It's not even cooked. It's just raw. It was lovely. But, it's like... We- Historically, though, getting back to this, the, the, probably the most important relationship believed by many of these historians is the relationship between horses and people and anthropologists and that, you know. But let's have a song and I'll, I'll tell you where this starts to make sense with the topic because this show's supposed to be about cars and not horses. This is Uslers by Lupe Fiasco. There are some mythical horses as well. You've got unicorns, which supposedly stem from Christianity for most people, but they also get discussed a little bit in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which we touched on, I want to say, six episodes ago in the Great Flood at least. Um, In the Christian story, or the Garden of Eden, which we should probably do an episode on, really, uh, the unicorn didn't get punished by God, or was it Enki or Enlil or whatever was in charge of Eden in the in Gilgamesh's story um, whatever it is you believe anyway that created the, the things in the garden the unicorn was allowed to leave the garden of its own volition with Adam and Eve because it felt love towards them both right so what if the unicorn is allegorical for some sort of technology what if the god character can be replaced with the term lizard people and, and furthermore what if that technology was the genetically engineered biomechanical creature known as the greys little 
or thought for your hair. The same creature that Alistair Crowley drew that exists with its massive forehead and yeah, they, he, he accompanied him throughout his life of, of um, um, bumming that poor uh, bloke that he dragged around with his life in the desert when he was bumming that guy in the sand. And, and if the greys truly are a biomechanical feats of an unknown science and are able to exist in the fourth dimension, then surely that is exactly what is meant by unicorn because there's never been any record or actual sightings of unicorns yet there's been tons of reported sightings of greys now if you wanted to you could view the unicorn another way and imagine the unicorn to be a weaponized horse which could easily be construed as a tank i guess in a certain light because of the extension on its head it kind of resembles a tank but it's definitely a horn but if you wanted to take it a little bit remove it a little bit that horn is a weapon on a horse and the horse could mean machine or car or vehicle so it's a, it is a weaponized vehicle a weaponized horse then you've got these other machines though that have been replaced with horsey terms in mythology if you take that stance pegasus a flying horse a, a flying machine a helicopter or a plane or even a spaceship meet and finally you've got a centaur but getting back to the spaceship bit maybe it was just their way of going pegasus it was it's a flying horse because if only i could say a group of 10 people or so saw the spaceship and saw them ride it and they were riding horses around and normally and they were like, oh, fucking hell, how are we going to explain this to people? Let's explain it as a horse, a flying horse. Because we use a horse to move around. They use that to move around. That must be the horses where they come from. And they've seen them feeding it in their eyes, putting fuel in or whatever it is that would power a spaceship. And they're thinking, oh, silage looks different on their planet, doesn't it? But the centaur, right? The centaur takes some of the argument uh, that I put forward about the greys. It's half man, half horse. Now, when you hear about it from historians, right, um, you know, it's it's like a, an abomination of nature. It's a, it's a creature not too dissimilar from the mine at all, you know. But if you remember that horse could mean machine, then that means it's half man, half machine. A cyborg, maybe. Now, they're described as being stronger than a man, faster than a man, more aggressive and more feared than men. Most importantly, though, is a love of drinking, which, as I'm saying, with the fuel, which it means they've got a constant requirement for liquids. Now, fuel is mostly liquid when we put it in machines, so could this have been oil or, or petrol, maybe? Possibly, a uh, push, even diesel. It's difficult to know for sure if, if centaurs could have been sentient machines, but it's not impossible to imagine that at least one could have been. And, and maybe it wasn't evil. Maybe the others all seemed evil because they were programmed to fight, like the metal men that we learnt about in the Robots and Automatons episode. One centaur that fits the bill, though, would be uh, Chiron, uh, C-H-I-R-O-N, which was often described as intelligent, uh, wise, as an oracle, uh, so it could... You know, that means they, they had access to algorithms, potentially. They could work out the future and potential activities that could take place. And supposedly, right, this Chiron gave teachings to many of our philosophers. So what's easier to believe? That there were there was one half-man, half-horse, and, and, you know, creature that was dead clever and could speak, which sounds ridiculous, or that there were one-half-man, one-half-horse creatures roaming the fields, that were actually some form of machine man in ancient times. We're supposedly the closest we've ever been to transhumanism in like modern day now. But what if we're the, only the closest to transhumanism in the same way those memes that I go about depict 30 years ago and 30 years ahead saying things like, you know, oh, 2052 is as far away as 1992 was. Do you know what I mean? Like, we could be just the same distance away, but we, we just think, oh... Fucking hell, aren't we great? But bringing up the lizards, though, getting back to them for a minute, there's loads of traditions of man and horse defeating lizards or giant reptiles throughout history. One of them's obviously the story about St. George, which I read about St. George was something to also do with, um, I think it was saving a Muslim child or something, which I've never heard before. Um, I, I didn't know that. I only knew of St. George as slaying the dragon or the dragons. But you've also got St. Patrick who chased off the snakes in Ireland and I'm going to bet that St. Patrick probably rode up some form of quote-unquote horse from time to time. But if these horses are actually grazed, then 
Maybe we worked with the Greys to overthrow or chase away the Lizard People overlords. Maybe the Lizard People cast the Greys into another realm, or cast us to another realm. And that's actually what the story of the Garden of Eden is about. The Garden of Eden could have been, you know, part of the fourth dimension, and we got cast out with some form of benevolent machines to fend for ourselves away from the genetic engineering leaders of the fourth dimension, the Lizard People. When I was reading up on some of this stuff about horses and that and trying to see if I was right and if it was a possibility, I found out this there was a story where Horus kills Set whilst riding a horse, which goes against what I told you a few weeks ago in the Ancient Egyptian Creationism episode, where Horus was actually said to be riding a ship or a boat. Now, I'm wondering if horse is a word that gets used to replace the word ship, boat, car, plane, spaceship, motorbike hovercraft you know it it could be it even like you know because it's a it's a thing that everyone can recognize everyone knows what a horse is whereas the word car might mean different things to different people everyone knows a horse is a horse and can imagine it as that also it's a way to hide history and conceal it and change little bits but if you change enough little bits like just by changing all the all these instances of cars throughout history they've with replacing it with horses look how popular horses now have become look at the these courses courses for horses fucking equestrian courses you know at colleges and stuff it's fucking mad mate all be, and instead of fucking mechanics you know people are learning how to fucking feed a horse it's ridiculous whereas they could be teaching kids at school horus drove a spaceship with his his kind of mate the anti-hero let's call him and and killed set repeatedly uh, from his spaceship, but they don't. These people that I read this story from are saying he did it on a horse, which doesn't even seem practical. How could he have rode across the skies in a horse? Unless it was Pegasus, which was probably a helicopter. It just seems that they can change that term of whatever the thing was, the mode of transport, they can just replace it with horse, and it helps it to fit the the person's belief who's got that story in front of them, regardless of language or culture. But let's have a song, this is Defender by Aesop Rock, it's the Blockhead remix. Now we know that back in the day, they had the movement of people in it. Uh, the Vikings had boats and other people probably had actual horses. Now we're led to believe that a lot of people just walked around. Marching in armies or trundling through mountains before turning on each other and killing each other like the people in the Donner Party did. So I find it impossible to believe that there was a time where people weren't using horses. I find it much easier to believe that there was a mode of mechanical transport, though either a, a, a car or something like a car that has been used for thousands of years, you know, and then it got destroyed or civilization was destroyed and cars couldn't be used anymore. And one group of people, right, you've got to consider with this, is the Romans. They're known for making straight roads. But if they weren't using fuel, then why did they have to make the roads straight? Because they're not saving money, they're not saving fuel and making it as cost-effective as possible. And if they didn't have cars, that means that these things were made for horses. So if historians are supposed to be as pedantic as they are and everything's got to be exact and everything and science has to be right and exact and everything, every story has to be true, then why why is that a phrase? Why is that a thing? The Romans made straight roads. Why doesn't everyone say the Romans were known for building straight bridleways or paths? But it's explicitly told to us that they made roads. We already know the Romans had access to robots from the Robots and Automatons episode. So it it just seems it just seems odd, innit? Like, why why lie? Why why lie about them having horses? They, they could if they had them robots, them tin men, the metal men, the silver men, then they could easily have had some form of car or lorry. The idea of a bloke or a lady uh, suddenly going, you know, this this walking malarkey is ridiculous. Uh, we should sit on those horses and have them drag boxes of stuff along these bridleways and maybe we should pave these bridleways and call them roads there's just way too many holes to the theory like literal plot holes uh, you know it doesn't make sense 
It's a lot easier to believe that they had some mode of transport at some point and then lost it and then made do with horses whilst they waited to develop that technology again. It doesn't even take a high IQ to be able to see that as plausible. Or, or maybe instead of waiting for the right technological leaps to occur, they had to wait to find a, few, uh, a fuel source that was suitable again. Maybe all of their scientific records were on paper and ancient computer chips and having lost the computers that used those chips in the paper being, you know, rotted away or we got burnt uh, maybe due to the apparent intergalactic nuclear war with the martian lizard people possibly if you believe that the lizard people are from mars and and not a, an extra dimensional entity it's up to you i'm not here to tell you what to believe maybe the people of ancient times slowly lost knowledge of it all just naturally maybe that's why book burnings have occurred throughout the history and, and libraries have been raided what if the clay tablets from Sumeria and whatever the scrolls were that the British government pretended were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq had detailed on them were ancient knowledge or other fuel sources, you know? Maybe that's why after a long repeated campaign in Iraq and surrounding areas were finally able to have rechargeable batteries or solar power and electric cars. Perhaps there was a new world leader, like a you know, like Genghis Khan or someone that decided to destroy all these records or to destroy the vehicles in order to control the movement of people again. A lot like how people believe electric, electric cars are going to be introduced to limit the movement of people. You know, because... Uh, I mean, think about it, like, they've got to limit the distance they can travel due to having to plug the car into the mains. Once the battery stops holding its charge for as long, the wire's only going to go so far, so you can probably only have, what, like, a, a kilometre long wire, and they're all going to get tangled in that, and no one's ever going to go anywhere, they're all going to start walking around again. Maybe this is why we started using horses in the past, because we were like, these fucking electric cars are stupid, they don't hold the charge, there's no such thing as a trickle charge. So these, they, they, we charge the cars overnight, it ruins the batteries, we don't want to keep buying new batteries, because... It's bad for the environment. Oh, man-made global uh, fucking climate change and all that again. We can't be having that. We've already tried to solve that. So we'll plug them in. And then maybe some clever bastard will come along. Instead of everyone going, let's use horses again while we work this out and fucking develop oil-powered cars again, someone might come along and go, do you remember scale electrics? We could put a little dent along the ground. And it's like on tracks, like a tram. But it's a car and you just jump in it. You can get in there yourself or you could rent it out for the day. And, you know, homeless people could fuck in there and, and take, you know, whatever drugs they've got in there while you're at work and they leave you 50p in the fucking, um, you know, in the, the bit where you throw your cigs when you get in the car. And then other people jump in and they're like, oh, they only left 50p. I'll have that. And then you, you're out of pocket. All because of these fucking electric cars, mate. It's fucking stupid. And it won't be the first time that cars have been used to potentially affect the population either. There's a good chance we initially used fuel with lead in it because we couldn't find this ancient information. But what if, right? What if it was being used to purposely alter the neurological habits of children? What if it was being used to alter the very air we breathe? To change our genetics? We're pretty sure that it was happening even, right? Even scientists claim it was happening. The, the hard part, right, is to prove that it was all done on purpose. Changing the chemical makeup of a planet, right, that's called terraforming, which I imagine you all know. Now, one of the best ways to do that, apparently, is it a planet with various nuclear blasts. Something that started happening in the 1940s and then continued for a little while. But we also started using a lot more cars around then as well. So if we couple up the catalyzing um, effect, let's call it, of nuclear explosions in our atmosphere with the cars that drove around pumping out lead into the air along with whatever else was mixed in back then, then you've got to think it must have been on purpose, especially when you've read stuff that suggests the whole prohibition era of America was mostly because ethanol could have been used for fuel, which could have been better for the people breathing it in. But, you know, maybe the, the ethanol may have had other undesirable effects in the air, maybe making people docile or something, which isn't really what you need when you're ramping up a cold war on either end of Europe and also trying to kill imaginary Chinese people in a Vietnamese jungle. You need people angry, innit? You need them impulsive. You, you, you need people ready for war. And it turns out inhaling a shitload of lead will definitely do that to a person. Gets you all riled up for some reason. Now, I once saw a couple of lads at school repeatedly stab each other in the thighs with pencils and they seem to get more and more aggravated as well. But they were graphite pencils, innit? But it just goes to show... That, that people just need that little push towards violence. 
And it seems to me that's exactly what leaded petrol was to a lot of people. Now, we already know that fuel is used to control society in terms of the economy, but most people probably don't know it affected communities on a smaller scale by increasing the murder rate and general violent atmosphere. Since uh, since lead's been removed from petrols, there's been a huge decrease in violence as well through the past 40 years. People have become smarter, there's an increase in IQ, and, and there's been at least 50 million crimes prevented as a direct effect, according to the UN. Anyway, let's have a song. Uh, it's, uh, this is a, a guy who's a, a threshold favourite. Apparently it's uh, Mr. Traumatic with Demon Flow. If you're enjoying this, right, do you know what you might like? You might like a fucking bollock boy, mate, which is a little robot with mouse testicles in. Six quid on worldaroundyou.com. There's other stuff as well, you know, like mystery boxes and fucking things I've made out of rats and dead ducklings and that. So fucking give them a look, mate. The prices start at like fucking a quid for a, for a piece of fossilised shell. And then prices vary going up. You can also get shirts in that as well from there. But go and have a look, mate, worldaroundyou.com. But I'm guessing if you've found this, you already know about all the taxidermy. But still, you know, maybe maybe now's the time to treat your missus to a little mouse heart. You know, I, I, I don't know you, though. I can't tell you what to do. I'm just glad you're listening to the shows. I'll fucking let you crack on. Cars are also, though, they're also responsible for cleaning up bits of society. They're not just used to change the atmosphere and the temperature of the earth. I mean, that's obviously if you believe in man-made global warming as it currently stands. But we've already learned that terraforming is real and it's a real possibility. But that's not the only terror they're forming. Cars should be striking terror into the hearts of every man, woman and child the world over. They're solely responsible for more deaths than mosquitoes. Now, mozzies rack up about a million deaths a year, whereas cars manage to rack up about 1.3 million kills a year. Now, to put this into perspective, if you were playing Call of Duty, that would mean you'd get about 14,000 extra nukes if you were getting nuke kill streaks one after the other, which is mental. Like, that's a lot, in it? That's a lot of fucking people. They're even more dangerous than the world's most deadly animal, the cow, and the world's second most dangerous creature, the day. Now, when bovine and ruminants are thrown in with cars, or more specifically, thrown in front of cars, they combine together to, to kill even more people. So if cars are so dangerous, then why aren't bicycles made illegal? It'd be deemed irresponsible to ride a unicycle down a road, so it's never really made sense to me that having this extra wheel suddenly makes it okay, like, that makes it safe, you know, you've got two wheels, so that's fine to, to ride next to, or sit next to this ton and a half of metal filled with accelerant, and now, I'm sure I've covered this before, but bikes should be illegal, it makes no sense that they're even a thing, and I'm starting to believe there are enemies, whoever, whoever they are, be it a country that's insidiously infecting the minds of the youth through education or something like that, or the big, you know, they. Uh, maybe it is the big they, but they, they, they're they trying to make more people ride bikes. Maybe that's so that they can be injured. Now, this would affect the world in various ways, isn't it? It removes the healthier members of society as they're killed off. It also rem removes them or, or limits the chances of breeding as well, because in, in another sense, if they're not killed off, because it's very, very off-putting to a woman when she finds out that a grown man is actually a cyclist. By having more cyclists on the road, it also means that they become a, a larger political voice, meaning maybe they start to get rights. It also gives a, a group of people an identity, which they can use to play the game of identity politics, by having um, more RTAs, road traffic accidents, with cyclists as victims as well. A politician could easily be swayed to ban cars in certain areas to make it safer for cyclists, right? But they could even be persuaded to install some form of scale electric system like what I spoke about before, in just in their constituency, so that cars are less likely to knock some dickhead off a bike. This, right, this should be a fucking huge concern for you, because that means less freedom. Yeah, it means you could probably start drinking and driving, because you won't actually be driving, which, in a way, I guess is a new freedom, but you also won't be able to just nip down that side road and avoid the traffic lights. Is it worth giving up a freedom for the sake of a cyclist? 
Another way that our enemies could use our use of cars against us is, again, by encouraging everyone to cycle because this means there's less people using fuel, less people buying oil, uh, less screen wash, and that means less plastic bottles being being made by these people with uh, fucking jobs making plastic bottles. It means less people in jobs mining the resources for making plastic bottles, less people mining oil, less people on oil rigs. Oil rigs are fucking well-paid jobs, and that's a lot of money coming out of our country then being removed, uh, and less, less big houses being built, more smaller houses, which means, you know, everyone hates landlords. That means landlords have got more houses to rent out because there's more houses rather than less, less houses but the bigger and privately owned you know and then and all these other repeat purchases necessary for keeping our economy strong and our cars going they only need to buy a new helmet as well when they fall off the bike and a pump they'll buy one pump probably for the life of the bike uh, maybe for two bikes because it provides free air for their tires they don't have to go to a petrol station and pay 50p for some air they don't even need a car battery to get it going mate to, to, you know the pump they can just pump it themselves because a, a bike tyre doesn't have the same pressure in it as a car. No MOTs, so mechanics are losing money. Cycling proficiency isn't compulsory, so driving instructors can't just take on a new role using their transferable skills from the previous role. Um, those lads that hang around at the junction by Foster's Brewery on the way to Manchester with a squeegee and a dirty rag, they'll have to find a new way to try and fucking annoy people when they're on the commute to work. There's just a lot of moving parts to this that needs to be considered before the bike people start taking over. And right at the root of it all is this fear of global warming, something that may have been introduced to, to play on the emotions of people that have been uh, brought on, say the emotions have been brought on, let's say, by these fucking chemicals in the air in, that have been used to enhance the air around them. Maybe that's what lead in petrol was good for. It kept people angry, innit? You know, if you're always angry, you're not worrying about the world or about the ozone layer. You're focused on your own life. You know, maybe blinkered to it, but still focused. Maybe the new fuels enhance different emotions. Maybe. That's why they're called E-something. They put E-numbers in food and sweets, and that makes kids act a certain way. Yet we've got E-numbers in our petrol, and, and, and we know that stuff in petrol can make people act a certain way, but yet scientists were, weren't were on, you know, telly warning parents about that on TV. They just wanted to make people stop eating the blue Smarties because they affect their kids. But what about this E10 fuel? It's obviously going to cause a different emotion than the E5 fuel did. I don't know how the emotions are ranked, but because it's E10 and that was E5, this could either be twice the intensity of the previous emotion or half the intensity of the previous emotion. Only time's going to tell us Oh, that's that's what's a shame about this. It'll be too late to know, just like it was with the lead. Well, we know that cars can be used to terraform a planet. But what or who could they be terraforming for? I know you are asking yourselves that, thinking, oh, what's this going to be for? Now, put, put simply and plainly, interdimensional entities, mate. There are many beliefs that mirrors can in fact act as portals. Uh, mirrors uh, 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 doorways uh, uh, or windows or... Uh, entrances let's call them to for demons and extra dimensional entities into our dimension now there is a jewish belief and i think i think there's some irish that go for it and all uh, that so they'll cover the mirrors when there's been a death because it's possible to then see demons in your house through the mirrors in the week surrounding a death like afterwards and maybe the second week after but now think about a car for a minute each car has at least three mirrors that's two wing mirrors and a rear view mirror. Maybe even an extra one in the sun visor for the passenger seat. That's potentially four doorways to a different dimension or from a different dimension. I don't know if they're the two way doors. Now think about that. 1.3 million five deaths a year from car related incidents. That's a lot of deaths and an awful lot of mirrors suddenly opening up as portals to these demonic creatures. Is that the true reason for all the cars on the road? Are the ease of travel and convenience of not having to carry your shopping home, merely byproducts, a way of sweetening the pot? Like that idea that Hitler gave everybody portable radios because they could listen to music and to, to news and stuff, but realistically it was just to spread propaganda. But they give them this extra, this thing, oh, look how great this is. But this is actually what we're doing with it. You could probably tie it into a few things, but I don't know if anyone's ever tried to tie it to cars. They've, they've done it to convince us to drive around the port portals around the world allowing these creatures i imagine relatively safe passage into our world it's worth thinking about in it 
Is the whole idea of global warming caused by CO2 and, and cars purely concocted tripe because they would rather have people believe in those invisible forces disrupting our world rather than have people know the actual truth about the actual invisible forces that are trying to act in our world? Is there a third, more powerful group that is playing the cars and cyclists against each other, getting the best of both worlds in every sense of the term? More mirrors in the world, more doorways, more crashes in cars, more deaths and even more extra deaths now caused by cars clipping the unarmoured cyclists. Then, whilst they park their car away to await the ambulance and, and they reach an emotional fever pitch because they may have just paralysed or killed someone and, you know, obviously we've learned recently if they're wealthy, they're getting sued and if they're poor, they're going to prison. And, and you know what loves these negative emotions? What's drawn to these negative emotions? Extra dimensional entities. By feeling bad about accidentally killing a cyclist, you could be solely responsible for an interdimensional takeover. So... I guess if you do accidentally cause a crash, you got to own it, mate. Don't feel sad, or at least, you know, don't show it around a mirror. Because there's a good chance that's all cars were actually invented for. And and that's the end of the show, guys. That's all I've really got on cars. A fucking... Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you've learned something this week. Uh, don't forget to give Truth Seeking a go. Uh, you can find Truth Seeking and, and my show on all different streaming platforms now, you know, and, and leave us a rating as well on either or, you know, or both, ideally. Or fucking see us in a bit, guys. Thanks for listening, man. If you enjoyed the show, you should probably go and try Truth Seeking. That's T R W O F Seeking. There's in like S W E K I N G, not like a fucking type of helicopter. But it's it's me and Jimmy Budd, a comedian from the UK, fucking well from England, like me. Don't know why I'm saying it like that. Either way, though, go and fucking have a listen. You can find a one or two in the in the feed for this. There's the crop duster, um, but there's there should be by by the point you're listening to this, at least fifteen episodes going out. For truth seeking, so you might enjoy that, mate, and fucking leave leave a review on here and that. Leave a you know, leave a comment if you've watched it on YouTube, and if you do have YouTube as well, you can actually watch some of these. You can have them playing on a loop with my cartoon playing on a loop, whilst you listen to four or five episodes of it. So you know, maybe throw that on at night time or something, because that might help as well. Because that might mean I can eventually monetize my YouTube. Anyway, fucking thanks for listening, man. I'll see you in a bit.